Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, tonight's Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. Um, the first item on the agenda are apologies for absence. Um, I have apologies from Councillor Richard Ford and Councillor Ben Price. Um, we have Councillor Chris Cook substituting for Councillor Ford. Um, I've heard that Councillor uh, Dan Maycock is running slightly late and will be here in 15, 20 minutes. Um, just like to say uh, thank you for uh, Sarah Daniels and Andrew. Um, Cooper, sorry, um, for their work on the committee and just to welcome Roy Rogers and um, Councillor Dan Maycock. So item two are declarations of interest. Uh, I've heard of none. Um, so we'll move over to item three, which is an update from me. Um, there is no minutes for this meeting as the last meeting was previously uh, very, very close to this one and they've not, they've not been completed as yet. Um, so I think we'll move on to item four, which is a dual stream recycling service quarterly update. If you recall, this was something that was um, looked at last year and we agreed that there would be quarterly updates on the progress made and also the um, updates to the review that was done over the summer. So I'm going to hand over to Councillor Doyle to introduce. Thank you, Councillor Goodall. I'm here with uh, Nigel Harris, Victoria Woodhouse and Andrew Barrett to update you on the dual recycling. The purpose of the report is to provide the committee with a further update on the dual recycling collections, which were introduced in both Tamworth and Litchfield in May. The report re responds to issues that were raised by members at the last meeting, which was held in July. I'll now pass on to Nigel to take you through the report. Uh, good evening. Thank you, uh, Councillor Doyle. Um, just to give you um, an overview of, uh, of how things are going at the moment, very pleased to advise you that the um, service has, has settled down now and um, we're getting um, pretty good reliability and um, service is very much running um, in accordance how we planned it um, prior to its introduction. Hopefully you've had chance to see the, um, the briefing note that uh, that has been circulated. Um, I'm just going to pull out some of the um, sort of some of the sort of salient uh, salient points. Um, so service reliability is good now. Um, rounds are being completed on time. In fact, generally the recycling service is finishing sort of about an hour earlier than the maximum finishing time of four o'clock. Um, so um, that, that's good news. We've got uh, an average of 8.8 .8 crews working on the service. Obviously we can't have 0.8 of a crew. That, what, what that means is that uh, we have some days with eight crews and some with nine. It just depends on how all the rounds are, uh, are balanced. Um, the original model that was built a couple of years ago, um, prior to the uh, um, service being approved, um, predicted we'd need eight and a half crews. So we're not too far away from, uh, from the modelling. And we're hopeful with um, a round review plan for uh, later this year um, that we can get a little bit closer to the eight and a half that was modelled. Um, just need some, some tweaks here and there. Um, but we've also got to be mindful of the fact that we've got a lot of housing, housing developments in both Tamworth and Litchfield. Um, so we're always going to see infrastructure, um, a little bit of a creep on that as we need to serve those new houses. Um, one of the pleasing things is that um, residents seem to have got into the habit of using the service. Participation is high. People are putting their blue bin out with the glass cans and plastic and they're putting out the bag with the, uh, with the paper and card. Um, we've had um, over 7,000 requests for an additional bag, which is about 9% um, of households. Um, we had a little bit of a backlog for a while, but we've generally caught up with that now. So anybody who needs that extra bag, uh, that's been delivered. Um, interestingly, um, you've got a 
um, in your appendix, you've got all the statistics there. We are starting to see um, tonnage of waste generally falling off across the three categories, residual, organics and dry, so tonnage is down. We suspect um, a lot of that is to do with the fact that um, um, everybody was at sort of home for 18 months, two years uh, in lockdown. So, um, you know, a lot of the activities that were going on at home aren't. And also we might be starting to see a little bit of a kickback on the um, economic cycle um, with households feeling a little bit pinched on, uh, on income and probably not buying as much, um, as many goods and things as they used to. So generally all the tonnages are down. Um, garden waste has took a bit of a hit. We had a very, very dry summer and um, the grass uh, basically stopped growing for about two months. So um, you've got a table there that shows where we are with all the, um, all the statistics. Um, again, building on the, um, the resident participation, we're seeing the quality of the material is, is, is really good. Um, because we're using the bag, the paper and card is as pure as you can possibly get because the crew have the opportunity to inspect that bag. Um, I don't know if you've seen the trucks in operation. We use a slave bin on the back. So the bag is picked up, checked, and then tipped into a slave bin before being tipped into the back of the truck. So the crews really do have an opportunity to pull anything out of there that shouldn't be there. So the, the paper and cards getting very close to 99, 100% pure which is what the market demanded and was the main driver for changing the service because the paper and card got contaminated in the blue bin with liquids and all sorts of other things um, the contamination rates in the report are those for the blue bin so you're seeing us around about 8.8 percent .8%, but a lot of that contamination is people still putting a bit of paper and card in the blue bin and um, we have to keep working with residents to to re reaffirm um, how they should be um, using the service um, so that's really um, the issues on the on the actual service um, there are some other matters in the report that uh, I can touch on. Um, I was asked last time where we are with the issue of the bag and its size. Um, we're still um, taking advice from a solicitor. Litchfield has employed the solicitor on behalf of all the other Staffordshire authorities that uh, did a joint procurement. It was Canuck, South Staffs, uh, East Staffs obviously us and Litchfield, so I can't really share much more at the moment because there's legal sensitivity there, but hopefully can give an update at the next meeting. Um, further work associated with the rollout of the service. Um, we've got some of, it's about three, three and a half thousand um, properties that have communal bin stores. Um, um, they didn't go onto the service straight away because the amount of work that needs to be done to convert them from the old scheme to the new. We have to visit, inspect, um, order new bins, liaise with the residents. Um, we're working through sort of 200 parent properties, as we call it, um, to get those converted over. It's going to take probably at least five months. So they're still on, most of those are still on single stream at the moment, but we're gradually converting them over to dual stream. They've always been probably our most challenging properties to get the quality right, but now they've got a dual bin system going in. They're having a, a purple bin for paper and card and the blue bin for glass cans and plastic. Um, we're hoping that we can get the quality up to the same standard as the rest of the district. Um, another issue we talked about at last scrutiny was um, the national shortage of drivers, HGV drivers. Every council and anybody else who uses HGV drivers uh, has found it very, very difficult to recruit and retain over the, um, the last couple of years. I'm pleased to say we've embarked on a, a driver training strategy now whereby we're actively encouraging loaders who are, are existing employees to train up to be HGV drivers. Um, I think we've got nine in the pipeline. Um, it's a bit of a slow burner because they've got to have a medical, they've got to uh, get their provisional licence, they've then got to um, go through a series of tests um, and then do a, a full training course. 
And even then, we still have to be very careful about letting them loose on the road. It's like anybody who passes the car test to start with. You're probably at your most unsafe in those first few weeks and months. So it's a matter of mentoring and coaching them to become safe and efficient drivers. So we've got nine at the moment. Um, hopefully, all of those we can be converted into drivers. And then the next issue is to try and keep them going forward um, to stay employees of the Joint Way Service. Um, the last issue I'd got to was tasked to um, to bring to this committee was um, plans for Christmas, um, Christmas collections. Um, always a challenging time of year for us because we lose um, three bank holidays and everybody likes to put out twice as much waste, so we have to have a very robust plan. We did put the, um, the basics of a plan into this paper, but um, had to change it, unfortunately, um, because... Um, we can't get the tipping facilities to stay open long enough on Christmas Eve for us to take the risk of using that day. So, um, so we're going to have to go back and have a little bit of a rethink. Um, they've, the facilities want to shut at 12 o'clock, and I fully understand why. So we were proposing to bring the um, sort of the 20, the Monday the 26th forward to the 24th. That can't happen now because we will we'll be working till sort of three, four o'clock that day. Um, without tipping facilities, we can't do that. We've got a meeting tomorrow to um, to come forward with uh, with Plan B, um, which I will share with you um, when that's that's finalised. Um, one of the issues we've got to look at is um, not only communicating with the residents, but we suspect there'll be quite a lot of extra card out on the streets. So it's trying to get the right level of infrastructure to make sure that we, um, we get all the collections done. But as I say, we've got a meeting tomorrow to discuss that. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's all I've got to say. I'm happy to take, take any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Nigel. Um, before I bring other members in, I've just got a couple of comments, actually. Um, I think it's encouraging to see the amount of misbins sort of... Um, going down. Um, it's interesting that contaminated seems to be saying about the same, but I think what would be useful perhaps for the committee is that if the if the data was presented in perhaps a, a more graphical format rather than just as a table, because we might be able to sort of see the, uh, the trends a little bit easier. Um, so I think if you could take that back, because um, it, it does make it a little bit tricky to see the trends. Um, the blue bag and the size of it, and you mentioned that it's it's going through a legal process. Do we have a timeline for when that might be resolved? I've actually got a meeting with the solicitor tomorrow to discuss how we might take the matter forward. So okay. uh, be able to give a, a good An update, update and, okay. you know, on that in, in due course. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just my last question, uh, which might be for for Andrew, um, the independent review. Uh, when when will that be sort of published and we can get sort of it, I guess? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was going to just perhaps comment on, on that because I think it's, uh, it's an important part. I'm going to suggest that uh, a written report's brought at the next quarter. Um, uh, but in, in brief, the report considered a lot of the areas that's, that's actually in the, in the briefing notes um, in front of members today. So it's around round reviews, making sure it's fit for purpose, making sure it's, um, it's got sufficient capacity, but not too much capacity. Um, comms, public information campaign, is it robust? Can, can it be done better? Can it be done differently? Um, looking at utilisation of data, there's a whole wealth of data in, in the service that literally collects bins. Um, we need to be more um, more cognizant with um, with actually relying on data to drive the service forward, um, and then areas around um, the facilities that the service uses as well for disposal, making sure they're suitable, available, um, and, and to some extent it's, it's a difficult one because they're they're fixed where they are, um, but making you know making use of um, all opportunities with that. Some of the good points that um, I think it's you know it, it, it has highlighted is that contamination levels have come down. If members recall, that was one of the key elements for doing this was to actually get a better quality product, and that has um, that has been an outcome of this, despite some of the um, the, the issues we, we, we've experienced. And then finally, um, there will be an action plan coming out of this 
which is going to be measurable um, for the service to, um, to, to deliver, uh, some of which Nigel's mentioned already. Um, so I think that's probably all I can say on that at this point, if that's okay, Chair. Yeah, thank, thanks, Andrew. And yeah, I think um, we'll look forward to that that, that report um, for us to digest at the next meeting. So thank you. Uh, questions or comments from other members of the committee? John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a very, very quick one. Uh, just a point on the, uh, on the blue bags. Can I ask you, how is the quality of the, the blue bags uh, stacking up? Um, I ask really from a personal point of view because my own, the Velcro has all come off and it's flaps out <coughs> now. Um, is this a widespread problem, um, a design fault or something, or is it going to be addressed in the future if indeed this is a widespread problem? Thank you. Thank you. We are aware that uh, with any product, um, you do get um, a certain percentage where there's, there's, there's issues. Um, it doesn't appear to be a widespread problem. Um, we've, we've taken a few um, um, complaints on, on specification, but very simple. If you've got an issue, we will replace the bag for you. We've got several thousand still in stock. Um, obviously, time will tell how long they are... Um, um, become usable for. We, when we built the service, we um, we anticipated we'd get a turnover of around 10% per annum that we'd need to replace because obviously they're subject to all the elements and they're continually being turned upside down to be emptied. Um, I think I'd probably be able to answer that a little bit better in a few months' time. Um, we st we've only really gone through the summer period. It'll be interesting to see how the bags um, get through the winter. But um, well, we did um, when we spec'd the, the bags for the procurement, obviously we went for the standard Hessian type bag. The stitching, the specification was laid out. But when you're buying sort of 100,000 of them, um, you're always going to have a certain percentage on quality issues. They're handmade as well. So um, but it's something we'll, we'll keep an eye on. And we, Vicky and I can monitor the statistics there. We can see how many we get. But we're not being, not a massive rush of people complaining about it um, most people are asking for an additional bag because they're producing more paper and car rather than a fault with the bag thank you thank you Michelle thank you chair so three questions from myself so on appendix a where you've got the contaminated recycling bins and the numbers how many of those are the same properties, i.e. is it repeat offenders or is it individual households, if that makes sense? That's the first question. I'm more than happy to ask all three and then you can... The honest answer, I don't know for sure, but as Andrew mentioned, um, we're being encouraged to produce more and more data in detail. That's something we can look to do in, in future and let's see how many are... Um, second and third um, we will have the data in the office but it's not in the table so i can't give you an accurate figure at the moment maybe vicky can give you a, a better update we're currently looking at a, a system within the we have a system called bartek and we're looking at a process that they can put together which will record each time at the moment the cruise report contamination and we do know but what we're going to look at is a process where they do an attribute and then we can send a letter out and then if it happens again it'll tell us again and we can send another letter out so then we'll have a better idea of whether it's, it's people just getting it wrong as a one-off or whether it's an ongoing problem just just to make a comment on that actually i think that is important information that we do do record moving forward i think um give us a better picture of things thanks Thanks. No, I completely agree. It's the type of thing, especially when there is only limited resources in terms of following up. I know it says in the reports about the fact that doing a kind of campaign in terms of writing out to people and visiting people, if it's 50 houses, you can visit those. If it's 300, it's an awful lot harder. So it's, um, yeah, so that'll be really good for the next time there's an update. Um, the other two questions, um, one was going back to the show we were saying about Christmas. With the fact we've got numerous bags in storage, is there any plans to do any sort of communication to say to people, if you need an extra bag at all, this is available, I hang it on the hook of Christmas, 
but actually again repeating it because that wasn't something that is necessarily particularly well known that people can ask for other bags obviously 10 percent or nine percent of people have asked for them so there's people that are phoning up but if it, there can be some sort of comms to say do that that would be really really useful yes thank you i um i actually contacted newcastle um under Lyme um, a couple of weeks ago to see how they'd got on with previous Christmases and what they did is a warm-up through November, December where they because of Black, is it Black Friday and other events they start, they start to encourage their residents to think about uh, how to dispose of the card and one of their themes is encouraging people to have more, um, more bags etc if they need them and um, thinking about you know the capacity issues so um, we've had the information from Newcastle we're going to have a look at it and see how best we design our comms in sort of the lead up to Christmas we're obviously nervous at Christmas because it's our first um, Christmas on dual stream and we want to get it right um, but it's just balancing the right level of instruction um, infrastructure and comms uh, each area is unique so we can't just rest on our laurels and take a model from another authority. We're trying to learn what's best practice and apply it in Tamworth and Litchfield. Steve. Just one point, as a customer of the service, I actually ordered a second bag and it was here within a couple of days and that was last week or the week before. So um, the timing for the delivery of the bags is quite quick. I think I it's the one I personally delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Um, but I do agree, uh, heading up towards Christmas, there should be some sort of uh, advance comms warning people round about now, early November, to put an order in if they're going to need one. Thank you. Michelle. Thanks for that, Steve, for that and that addition. Thanks. And then my final one was where it's got on the, um, on the main report, section two, where it's got about the cost of the additional um, infrastructure is currently about £1,100 a week. It's got, it's taken from budget savings and additional income. Can you explain a little bit more about the additional income and especially kind of the impacts of recycling prices, etc. What's that looking? Is it stacking up? Okay. Because the quality of the recycling is, is excellent, um, we've got a good demand for that material. Um, prices had held up pretty well. Um, through the last few months, as we came out of um, COVID, demand for materials was going through the roof. Had a bit of a tail off now with the um, Ukraine war, so we're starting to see a dip and obviously potential of recession. So we've actually uh, done quite well in the first um, sort of couple of quarters on, on income, and that's how we're balancing the books. We, we depend on an awful lot of income. You've got it from our um, garden waste service, you've got it from recycling credits. Um, and as I say, you've got it from the sale of materials. Obviously, we're, we're, we're seeing, um, obviously, on our supply side in terms of um, materials and fuel, etc., those prices have been going up. But, um, but hopefully there's enough income coming in to make sure we've still got a little bit of leeway in the budgets to fund these things. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for that uh, update. Uh, my uh, question really was a little bit on the strategy of um, obviously your revenue comes in from what you sell, uh, which is all dependent on the supply that comes in from the, for, and as you can see, and you've just mentioned that there could be a recession and people being a bit more uh, cautious on what they buy and what they spend. So how does that long term, do you have any plans for the long term affect the strategy of this service? Secondly, um, what is the life cycle of a bag? Has anybody looked at it? Anybody anal analysed it? And, and if it is two years, three years or four years, that's a cost that's going to be obviously included at some point. And final question really is uh, the demand for Christmas. I mean, it is three months away. Um, it's not only going to be a busier time, which may or may not need you having overtime and more resources or more drivers on agency or, or whatever. Um, What's your strategy for that? Nigel, just before you come in, I just want to make a comment actually on uh, on Paul's question as far as the the life cycle of the bag. Um, and it touches on what, what John had to say. You have mentioned we've got information from Newcastle who obviously brought that, the service in um, 
before us, a little bit there, more advanced, and Stafford as well. So we should have that evidence, I would imagine. So that might be quite good to sort of, um, to perhaps explore in, in, in a bit more detail, actually, at the next meeting. Um, Andrew. Just on the bag life chair, uh, personal experience from the Stafford system, I think we are now three and a half years in and my bag is pretty much as good as a day it landed on the doorstep. So they're quite, quite long lifed from you know, a, a reasonable recycler. But again, that's just a, a personal experience. Yeah, just go back to the longer term strategy. I think what we have learnt over the last sort of few years is um, it's quality over. We like to get quantity in, but it's quality is so important. The end of the day, if you collect something from your residents that is of poor quality, the industry don't really want it. And if you can find someone to take it from you, you're going to end up paying through a lot of money to get rid of it. So um, I think we've seen obviously tonnages drop a little bit on recycling, but we've seen it drop on residual and organics. But what's pleasing us is um, we've never had a better relationship with the MRF than we have now. Because when we were on single stream, constantly getting phone calls, being called down there to inspect the material that was going in, um, relationships were quite strained at times because um, you know they, we weren't delivering to them what they needed to process. But as I say the quality is so pleasing. If I'd love to be able to take members down to the to the facility if they want to come, you look at the paper and card, and it looks like paper and card. You know how we expect it to look. Previously, it was just it was it was just a mix of materials. So I think that always has to be our long term strategy. It's the government's long term strategy. Um, this material is only valuable if it's good quality. If you take in stuff of poor quality, it just ends up you know can end up being incinerated. So that that is really um, where we see going forward. And that's where our education needs to be with the residents, letting them know that if we can get the quality right, it helps everybody, keeps the cost of the service down, it's good for the environment. Something like 10 to 15% of our dry recycler was, was just being thrown away because the quality was so poor. Once you have paper contaminated with liquids and oils, there's nothing you can do with it. There's no processing that will get, get over that. So that really is the long-term strategy. That's what we're doing with the multi-occupancies. That's why we've gone to dual stream. And I think that's the way forward for as long as I can see into the future. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, the other thought that's, that's constantly in my mind is as the government goalposts move and they become more and more challenging for all of us, is this, this system robust i guess it's robust now i'm thinking five ten years down the line are we going to be you know in the a good place yeah the government strategy talks about um without going into too much detail extend extended producer responsibility i don't know if you've heard of that term but what that basically means is um moving away really from local government paying for the vast majority of the collection and disposal costs and really saying to the packaging manufacturers, you've really got to pick up the bill for this because at the end of the day, it's their business, their profits. Um, but the, um, so you, you will potentially see a flow of money coming through this scheme to local government to, to try and offset some of the costs. I think we're a good couple of years away from that, but um, that's the government's thinking. Obviously at the end of the day, if the, if the the cost gets put on the pack packaging manufacturers, it'll probably go back to the consumers, but you'll start to see local government having to pay less of the bill for uh, recycling schemes. That, that, that's the hope, and that was what was in the strategy. Yeah, well, I work in the plastics game, so I do know that at the beginning of the year, they introduced the packaging tax for all, all packaging, and all that did is, if you were putting it in a paint can, the price of the paint can went up. So your paint went up. It didn't make it more or less volumes. It, it, you know, if Axel Nova want to put five million paint cans out, they will. So it is a little bit different to look at whether the stream of money is going to come back from the government. Whether it, it's supply and demand is reduced because they put the price up is another matter. I'm not convinced. But thanks for your update. Steve. 
Just a couple of points on that. Um, for Staffordshire, you've got the Joint Waste Management uh, Board as well as the Sustainability Board, which I both sit on, and they are already looking at what's going to happen in two or three years' time, and that filters down uh, to how we all interact together and work together with uh, whatever proposals are put forward. Uh, to note, um, waste levels are dropping across Staffordshire. It's not just in Tamworth. Okay, thank you. I'll just one more question or comment to make actually on the contaminated um, recycling bins. Is that contamina any contamination or is it ca contamination between sort of bottles and cans and, and paper and card? Um, because I've just done a quick graph and while there is a little bit of a drop off from the start of the, the service, I'm just trying to work out if we can compare that with what the contamination rate was before we started the service, if that makes sense. Again, we um, will bring you a bit more data next time and in graphical form. But um, it was about, we were running sort of between 10 and 15% for the whole tonnage previously. So if you got 10,000 tonnes you were collecting, 1,500 tonnes really was, uh, was contamination. When you say contamination, it's also um, materials that, um, that they... That they, they don't want or can't recycle. It's not necessarily food waste or nappies and things like that. But now we're looking at a situation where 40% of our um, tonnage, which is the paper and card, is virtually 0% contamination, maybe 1% or 2%. So if you take that 10,000 tonnes, we're saying nearly 4,000 tonnes of it now has got very, very low contamination. So the remaining 6,000 tonnes is what's in your blue bin. And we're saying that's sort of eight or nine percent. So you're starting to see um, your, your contextual level of contamination in tonnage terms falling quite dramatically. So if we say 1,500 tonnes on 10,000, you're down now to 60, sort of nine percent of 60 percent. So I can't do all the maths in my head, but it's quite a it's quite a substantial reduction. But let's let's have some graphs at the next meeting so we can we can show it in a in, a, in an easier way for you. I think I think that would be great, Nigel. Okay. I think that's uh, it's an important thing to take back, and and also perhaps some information from before the service that we can that we can feed in and, and, and see. Because while yes, we're looking at the how the service is working, I think it's good to have that that little bit of a run up beforehand. Thank you, Sheree. Thanks, Chair. Uh, sort of stole my point a bit, uh, but. But thank you for doing that. Um, you, you made the comment about um, tonnage being down, possibly because we're post-pandemic and people aren't working at home. But it would be good to have some uh, figures from pre-pandemic to, to compare. Um, can I ask one other question, please? Um, we used to be able to recycle cartons, and we no longer can. Is that a common thing across the country? Um, I know, I mean, I spend a lot of time in France and we can recycle cartons there. So I'm just wondering what, what's the sort of thinking behind it and is that likely to change? What we can recycle is very much governed on what the facilities will take from us. Um, we've only really got the Aldridge Murph um, as a facility that's within driving distance and we don't have the benefit of a transfer station. So we're very much governed by their input specification. Um, trouble with Tetra packs, they're extremely difficult to recycle because the card is coated with a layer of, of plastic in effect. Um, the technology and the infrastructure in the UK is very light at the moment. Um, but this is where the government strategy is trying to encourage the development of the, the, the industry and the infrastructure. I think over time, yes, we'll be able to do Tetra Packs again. But until there's, a, until there's a market, until there's the technology, it's very difficult. Disappointing to us that we had to stop that. But when the tender um, was put out for this contract, they made it very clear that that wouldn't be on the input specification. So, um, so even if we collected it, 
um, they wouldn't go for recycling. There's one or two facilities in the UK, but you can imagine that infrastructure is already overloaded with the carton. So it's about being going to have to be a little bit patient, let the government strategy sort of work through the EPR funding. Um, once the technology is sorted and the markets become available, um, I think we'll, we will see more and more Tetra packs being recycled again. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from anybody? Okay. Well, there's no specific recommendations for the report. Um, I hope Nigel can take back the the comments, perhaps that we've that we've made. Um, so, on from that is concerned. Thank you very much, Andrew, and Victoria, and, and Nigel, and Steve. Thank thank you very much, and you're you're welcome to stay for the rest of the the meeting if you want to. <laughs> Steve just something I'd like to add um, there's what they call the Larrick conference which uh, recently took place and also uh, there's the joint waste management meetings and the sustainability meetings which are all online which you can view and there should be some information there that you find useful regarding waste management thank you I can send details over later on request if you want. Please, please do. Thanks, thanks, Dave. And you're uh, welcome to go. So we're on to agenda item five, which is responses to reports of the Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. Um, if you recall the last meeting, we had some um, recommendations that are going to go to Cabinet, but have not yet gone, gone to Cabinet because there hasn't been a Cabinet that's been discussing the, that particular item. Um, but I'm due to go there next week, so uh, on the net carbon. So um, that's that one. Item six is the consideration of matters referred to infrastructure safe being grace from cabinet or council and there has been none. Item seven is the um, forward plan. Um, I hope everybody's had a chance to look through. I've, I've been through it and I know there was a new one sent out today, I believe. Um, uh, there's no items on there that I feel are Items we should be looking at on this scrutiny committee um, that aren't other, otherwise being covered. Unless anybody else has got any uh, thoughts on that, I'll, I'll move on. Um, item eight, our working group updates. We have a couple of working groups. Um, one is the facilities for HGV drivers. I know Councillor Price is looking at that one, but uh, unfortunately he's not here tonight to, to give any feedback, so I'm not sure if they've um, the working group has met at all. Michelle? I can give a little update to say we were due to be meeting and then all three of us had work commitments so we cancelled. Um, so we are hoping to meet either okay. later this week or early next week. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a Travellers Working Group. Well, the um, Health and Wellbeing Chair, Vice Chair, myself and um, my Vice Chair met um, last week um, to talk through some of these um, try and sort of thrash out where we were going to go with this. We're still waiting for some information back from county via the portfolio holder, so um, we can't move on with, with that in a, in a structured form until, until we've got that information, so I will continue to chase. Um, the other working group is the transport integration, um, something I know Paul's looking at and will give us an update further on um, towards the end of the meeting. Um, so, item nine is our scrutiny committee work plan. Um, I think we're doing quite well on getting through all the items on the work plan. The next meeting is the 22nd of November. Um, there is a number of items uh, outstanding to be looked at and obviously as the agenda goes out we'll, we'll, we'll populate that. 
So item 10 is exclusion of press and public. Um, so I'm going to move that in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities executive arrangements, meeting and access to information, England regulations 2012 and section 100A part four of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraphs three of part one of schedule 12A of the Act and the public interest is in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. I seek a seconder. Thank you, Chris. Um, all those in favour? Thank you very much. Uh, Jody, 